Hello friends, welcome to episode 92 of the Alabama Liberal Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about guns, immigration, abortion, or GIA is the acronym that I made up for that, and also the libertarian lie. So this is going to be a jam-packed episode, really even if I didn't have a huge title with like four different concepts in it, because I haven't done an episode since the middle of March. You know, Alabama Liberal, you would get pretty good at this podcasting thing if you didn't do like one episode a season, right? Like if you had a more consistent scheduling, a lot of times when you have like three months between episodes, you might spend your first 10 minutes just trying to shake the rust away. You're trying to get that muscle memory back. Okay, here's how we do this. There's been so much news between the end of March and right now, really more than you think there would be for this time of the year. Things I probably won't even be able to get to, such as the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial and like the Will Smith slap and a lot of celebrity stuff because the hard news of like DeSantis's war with everybody, Elon Musk trying to take over Twitter, the Supreme Court possibly overturning abortion, which is absolutely enormous. The battles about gun control, the January 6th hearings. And the January 6th hearings, this isn't really the purpose of this episode or the main theme of it, but it has to be mentioned because on MSNBC, which is where I enjoy watching the hearings from, this is like their version of the Super Bowl. So they're doing like six or seven hearings, and that really reminds me of the World Series or the NBA Finals or something, Game 7 of the January 6th hearings, and MSNBC's loving it. Chris Hayes, he's just barely able to sit in his seat. He's that kid who's just so excited that something's about to happen in class. And Rachel Maddow, she's thinking this could finally be what brings Trump down. It probably won't be, but it's still good to have it out there. I'm still really glad that they're doing it and they're putting it out there because it's good to have it out there and people talking about it instead of the Republican position of just, well, let's move on. And you see Kellyanne Conway literally said that when they were interviewing her about this stupid book that she's written. Now, keep in mind, this is a woman that Trump has bashed her. He's come out and said that her book is terrible and people shouldn't buy it. And she's an also ran. She's been kicked out of Trump world as far as he's concerned. No use for her. Her husband, George Conway, hates Trump. So her marriage could be in jeopardy if she's consistently defending Trump, even now that she's been kicked out of the Trump hemisphere and it's no longer financially viable for her to do it. And her daughter barely speaks to her. I mean, her daughter is estranged from her because probably some of it political and some of it personal. So you have to look at someone like Kellyanne and think, you know, I know you drink the Kool-Aid. I'm not sure you're really dumb enough to believe all the shit you say about Trump, but your husband's against him. Your daughter's against him. Trump's against you. He's literally said shit about you in public. What point could there possibly be to keep defending him, but she's still going to do it. And her thing is like, oh, well, why are we talking about January 6th? Why aren't we talking about Biden's gas prices or something like that? And of course, that's all the media really wants to discuss, this myopic, scary obsession with Biden's poll numbers and how low they are, partially because of the media, which is crazy to me. They'll be like, yeah, this guy that we've shit on for a year and a half, his poll numbers are pretty low. And then gas prices, which really bothers me because, number one, the war in Ukraine is still going on. Last episode I had, it was somewhat about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the war crimes they're committing there, the atrocities that we're seeing there on a daily basis. Thousands of Ukrainians are being killed just about every day. And then to have that on the news in February, March, real news. I mean, you could turn on CNN or MSNBC, you could see footage of cities being blown up. You could see babies crying in the streets. You could see dead bodies on the news. I mean, this is really happening. It's still going on. It hasn't stopped. But the fact of we could watch real news in March And then a few months later, we turn it on now, and it's like, uh, gas prices are over five bucks a gallon, and why is the pennies? Well, this just makes me sick that Biden hasn't done anything about gas prices. It really kind of feels like we're spoiled, selfish in a lot of ways, to have all this calamity going on, and yet we're whining about pennies at the pump. And of course, the real solutions to fix that shit, nobody wants to talk about them. The House Democrats, they passed a bill that said no more price gouging. The big private oil companies that fund America's gas, mostly about 90% of America's gas comes from private companies. They passed a bill to stop their price gouging. Not one Republican voted for that. So when you have Republicans going out there and making this case about gas prices consistently, constantly beating that into people's skulls, say, why did you vote? No, on the price gouging bill that the House Democrats passed, not one reporter has asked them that or really emphasized it or said, why should America believe you're going to help gas prices at all, given your stance on this? Two, gas prices are too high. Biden should do something. Okay, I'd like to do something. I'm going to meddle in the free markets. No, 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 you can't do that, you socialist. You know, it gets back to that libertarian ideology that we're going to debunk later in the episode of basically being like, the free market is God and the government shouldn't do jack shit to do anything in the free market. And it's like, okay, so how can you blame 
blame Biden for any economic problems or for gas prices specifically when you don't want that industry to be regulated. You don't want the government to interfere in that. A lot of countries have nationalized oil companies. That's one of the reasons that any progress on climate crisis is so difficult. There's an incentive for governments to keep pumping out oil. In China, we talk about the great Chinese economic miracle. The three biggest companies in China are state-run oil or coal companies. A lot of countries, they have no incentive to really get rid of oil or downplay that because they're funding the government. Our country, the government is almost being regulated by the oil company. It's almost the reverse of what it should be. They don't want any meddling going on in that, especially the Republican Party, which the oil companies absolutely fund. I almost believe the oil companies are artificially raising gas prices to hurt Democrats. They would like the House and to go Republican and the Senate to go Republican, and they know there'll be less regulation for them, probably tax cuts or something like that, whatever they're looking for. And they know Democrats don't like oil and gas. They would like to phase it out. They would like to do alternative energy and renewables, and they don't want that. So it's almost like they're going to raise it up the four months before the midterm elections and keep it high because typically it's higher in July and August. It's the summertime season. And by that time, people are just so like, oh, well, we hate Biden. We hate Democrats. We'll vote for any Republican that can. And most industries don't take a strong political position one way or the other. Like a company such as Disney, which I know because of that idiot DeSantis, people think that's a liberal company. It's not a liberal company and it never has been. After all, they gave him money. They contributed to his campaign and several of the Florida legislature's campaign and the overall Republican government that runs Florida top to bottom. They've contributed to that system with campaign contributions. It's really been an apolitical company for decades, but Republicans are now in that mindset of anything not specifically geared towards us, we must boycott it and we must raise hell about it. If it's the NFL, which has always been kind of politically neutral, by and large, the owners are pretty conservative. The players might be pretty liberal, but they sort of balance out. Same thing for Hollywood, where the media companies that own these studios aren't necessarily liberal at all, but the talent might be pretty liberal. At Fox, Seth MacFarlane might be a liberal, but Rupert Murdoch owns it. And so usually a lot of stuff is kind of apolitical, but they're now in that mindset of, no, top to bottom, you better be contributing to us and doing what we want you to do, or else you are liberal and you are pinko commie scum. But the oil companies are very different because 90% of ExxonMobil's political contributions go to Republicans. And the few Democrats that do get contributions, it's Joe Manchin or people like that that are really pretty half-assed and barely in the Democratic Party. No secret that there's kind of a war brewing between the Democratic Party generally and then coal companies and oil companies who typically give a lot of money to Republicans. I mean, they're an industry that absolutely takes sides, and they absolutely would try to influence an election one way or the other. Then you have when people are whining about, oh, Biden should do something about gas prices. When people whine about the gas prices being too high, I've loved in the past to be like, that's why we should have alternative energy. We should do wind and solar for everything. No, 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 we can't do that. And it's like, okay, so you want to keep oil and gas forever and make us a slave to their prices, but you don't want the prices to go up. If you really hate oil and gas, prices, your number one priority should be free energy, which is to basically have a power grid of solar and wind that pays for itself in a few years. Then you can do whatever you want. Imagine if you had an electric car and you could plug it into a shed that's got solar power. You're essentially going wherever the hell you want to for free at that point, basically, like around town, get your groceries, do whatever you like. It's basically free. I really like that idea for the economy. You unchain the American economy in a huge way. Airline tickets have skyrocketed. Flight I looked at back last November would have been $300 today, the exact same flight's about 750. It's more than doubled in the summertime season. And they go, well, some of that's because of the the gas and the oil and inflation and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, not really, because 30% of of planes cost is fuel. According to them, I'm not sure I really buy that shit, but each flight, 30% of the ticket goes to fuel costs. That would explain maybe a 10% bump in the ticket, maybe a 20% bump in the ticket. It wouldn't necessarily explain why it's more than doubled. It's two and a half times the price that it was. That doesn't really explain it. And of course, it's price gouging. But imagine airplanes where the fuel costs are gone. Walmart, Target, Costco, wherever you buy your stuff, the fuel costs are gone from that. So I like the idea of the fuel costs are gone. You live in Huntsville, Alabama, and you say, oh, it's the summertime. I want to go to the beach. Let's go to Gulf Shores or whatever. Pretty much drive your car from top to bottom in the state with no fuel costs. So I really like that idea. And I think it's not only great for the environment, it frees up the American economy by not having this huge burden of transporting stuff and having those fuel costs eat up a big chunk of the cake. Yet Republicans don't want that. And they vehemently don't want that. 
that. So you have people whining about gas prices who, number one, they don't want Biden to regulate it. Number two, the attempts to regulate it, like the House bill to stop price gouging, they haven't voted for them and they don't support them. And number three, when it comes to the goal that is really not as long-term as you think about getting rid of oil and gas and replacing that with renewables, they vehemently fight that at every turn. So if you fight that, you have to sort of be okay with the price spikes that come with oil and gas. And of course it comes, well, prices were very low under Trump. It is true that in 2020, the dystopian hellscape that was COVID in 2020, gas prices were pretty low as nobody could go anywhere or do anything. And the only thing people wanted to use gas for was to set buildings on fire during the George Floyd riots. Okay, you could turn on the news. We look like Ukraine. There were fires everywhere. There were people in the streets raising hell. There was looting going on. Yeah, but gas prices were low. Don't you want that back? And it's like, no, I don't want that back because gas prices being low is not a good economic measure of an economy at all. Europe has very high gas prices. That doesn't mean their economy is bad. It doesn't mean their standard of living is not better. It is better usually. The EU, the European Union, then you go to some place like Saddam Hussein's Iraq, gas might have been 30 cents a gallon. Doesn't mean it was a great place to live, but man, gas sure is cheap. Uday and Husay came by and they said they wanted to rape my wife and their Saddam's son, so I have to let them. But man, look at how cheap that gas is. It's not really a good measure of anything in terms of standard of living or the overall economy. The Middle Eastern economies, they may have very cheap gas. Poor countries where they can't afford to charge much for gas. They might have very cheap gas because the people can't afford five bucks a gallon. They just will ransack the gas station. They'll kill whoever owns it, take the gas and run away. It'd be like ISIS or something. And you know, some of that I wonder about in California because like some places in California, gas is like, I think it's gotten over seven bucks. They shoved the most expensive gas station in the country. And of course it was in California. I'm like, you know, what if they burn that place down? I bet gas would get a lot cheaper then, wouldn't it? The stores are random, but be like, did we say uh, six bucks a gallon? We meant four bucks a gallon. Yeah, that's what we meant. I bet gas would drop overnight to that point. And then that brings you to the next Republican thing, which is crime. Crime, crime, crime. They emphasize that. Once again, you get to a scenario of if you're that worried about crime, why are you supporting the repeal of abortion? Because abortion has been proven to lower crime rates, legalized abortion. Back in the 90s, there was supposed to be this big, massive crime wave. That's what everybody anticipated. The beginning of the 90s would have been about almost 20 years from the Roe versus Wade. You had the at-risk youth that wasn't born. There was an entire generation of hooligans wasn't born because abortion was legal. And so crime rates went down. Freakonomics basically proved that because of legalized abortion, the kids that would be most likely to commit crimes because their parents don't want them or they can't afford them or they're not going to really take care of them, that's their most at-risk group of criminals. It's not saying that's where every criminal comes from, that group, because obviously Trump doesn't come from that group and he's a pretty huge criminal. But a lot of criminals do come from households of abuse, households where the parents just don't care, they don't want to raise them, where they can't afford to raise them, where they're poor their whole time, and they think, okay, I got to do something to pad my pockets, you know, dealing drugs or whatever. They weren't born at all. And that made crime rates go way down. You tell that to Republicans and they get very strange about that idea. They don't like that idea. They say that's not proven, blah, blah, blah. Well, it was proven. Freakonomics did a pretty good job of proving it. So why would you, if you were that worried about crime and you're that worried about inflation from the federal government, you think the government's spending too much money. It's just spending way too much money and it's you want to cut these social programs. Why are you then forcing the kids to be born where the parents don't want them or they can't afford them? That would seem to be counterintuitive to your goals. And they just, uh, abortion's murder, and they just won't get past that. And it's just in their heads that that's just the worst thing that's ever been. And so you have positions that they're not very coherent, basically, where they say, we're pro-life. And then be like, there was just all these kids murdered in a Texas classroom, elementary school, and be like, yeah, but raising the age of an AR-15 from 18 to 21, that's just a step too far. We can't protect life to that extent. It's like you can protect life to the extent of you want to basically make women have kids they don't want and can't take care of, which is really a crime. It's really wrong. I think of that as almost a form of slavery, to force someone to have a kid that they do not want, they cannot take care of, they don't want it, they don't need it, they've asked not to have it, they don't want to have it, and you're going to make them do it anyway, and then turn around and say, that's how pro-life we are, that's the extent that we're protecting life, and then say, well, there was just a dozen school kids murdered in this classroom. Yeah, but we, raising the gun age from 18 to 21, just can't. That's just, the, we can't accommodate that. Like, that's just a bitch too far. They can't get there. I mean, this is pretty mild stuff. I did a trilogy of episodes back during the first season of the Them Liberal Podcast, which was about this. The first one was guns and then immigration and then abortion. At that time, I had a co-host, Michael. And then the guns episode, that was one of my favorite episodes from the first season because he was sort of more pro-gun control and I was more against 
a lot of the gun control measures, especially an outright ban of guns, which I know some Democrats do want that. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. The proposals they're making right now are extremely mild. I mean, raising the AR-15 age from 18 to 21, that's pitiful. I mean, that's a very mild thing. I think anybody could pretty much get behind that, but they can't even get that, which is pretty crazy to me. But I do know that there's more to it than that. I mean, in New York and Los Angeles and, and Minneapolis, I did meet people that were just completely terrified of guns, and they didn't want there to be any guns. They wanted a full ban on guns. I told the story about when I first moved from Alabama to New York, I would go on dates and like a woman might, something about guns might come up and I'd say, oh yeah, I own some guns. I don't have them here. They're in Alabama. And she'd be like, how many people have you killed? You know, like it would immediately freak them out that somebody was a gun owner. If you had a gun, it was immediately because you wanted to murder somebody. And that was the only reason you could ever want to have one or whatever. (laughs) There just wasn't any other reason for it. And there pretty much wasn't a second date at that point because it freaked them out so bad that somebody even would have a gun. And so there are people that would love an outright ban of them. And I know that. And it's not uh, totally sincere to be like, well, all we want is this little minor tweaks. That's all they want at this moment. But there are some people in the Democratic Party that want it banned. The same thing that happened with abortion. With abortion, it was death by a thousand cuts until they could get what they really wanted, which was Handmaid's Tale, replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court, and then being able to ban it outright, or at least repeal Roe versus Wade, so that some of the conservative states could do a full ban on abortion and could make it as punitive as possible. Because I almost debated about waiting to do this episode because uh, till they officially repealed Roe versus Wade or overturned it, because I'm still hoping that they won't do that. I, I don't think it's uh, realistic to assume that they won't do it. I think this is what they've wanted to do for a long time. This is why the Republicans didn't want Scalia replaced with Merrick Garland, and they wanted to force Handmaid's Tale down our throat the second Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. I mean, it was crazy. Six weeks before the election. Really crazy shit. When they had done eight months before the election in Scalia's case, they wouldn't even have a hearing for Obama's Supreme Court choice. They wouldn't even allow people to hear him or even do a vote on him. The reason for that hypocrisy, this is what they wanted. They wanted a repeal of Roe versus Wade. What you're going to have is really horrible for the country. This country is already kind of a bundle of raw nerves. Tensions are already too high between the red states and the blue states, and this is going to really inflame them. I've always been skeptical of the idea of a civil war. I still don't really believe that there will be one in this country because of how stupid it would be and how much money people would lose, and the fact that the states aren't as divided as they were on the issue of slavery. I mean, you had generations that were brought up under the idea that slavery was good, and others that brought up under the idea that it was horrible, and so the country could be kind of split along those lines. Now, I mean, 30 to 40 percent of Alabama is Democratic. 30 percent of California is is Republican. What are you going to have a civil war over? I mean, how could you even divide the country in that way? It would probably just look like a mess rather than red states and blue states, right? But I do think that this Supreme Court ruling is going to absolutely inflame tensions at a time when they're already too high. And I don't think the justices care. I think somebody like Samuel Alito is a total prick. I don't think he gives a shit about this country at all. I mean, I read the majority opinion that he wrote about it. It was insane. I mean, it was quoting like laws from 13th century England. I mean, you're talking about no internet, no satellites, no television, no cars, no vaccines. I mean, you're talking about shit where a woman has a toothache and they think she's a witch and they burn her or something. I mean, it was nuts that this guy's going back that far to quote certain laws when for the last 50 years, we've had Roe versus Wade and that should have been upheld. If you're upholding the law as it has been and you're that much of a traditionalist, you uphold Roe versus Wade because there's been 50 years of law that says that's the law of the land. What you're going to have is, like in Mississippi, they will say like, oh, not only is abortion illegal, but if a doctor performs it, he's a murderer and he needs to be on death row. You know, he's committed a crime and that crime is a capital offense and we are a death penalty state and he needs to be dead. And so that doctor will flee probably to California. They'll ask the state of California, turn him over. Our Justice Department wants him in California at that point might say no, and then it'll go back up to the Supreme Court where they will once again rule, oh, you have to turn over this fugitive because Mississippi law, he violated it. And you'll have a case that really inflames the country. It'll be something like that along those lines. You'll have a mother, because some states want to say, not only can you not have an abortion here, you can't have an abortion in another state. Like if you live in, say, Arkansas, but you travel to Chicago and you have an abortion, when you come back here, you've committed a crime. And so that will be another thing where there'll be a girl, a teenager, and this is a horrible term, but a destination abortion. I've used that before where it's like a destination wedding. I really believe I was the first person to use that term. And I noticed a lot of other sites copying me, but I used that years and years ago. Destination abortion where she goes, you know, two or three states away and has an abortion. And then when 
when she goes back to her red state, they're like, you've committed a crime. You're going to jail. What if, again, she flees to the state that she had the abortion or the state where she had the abortion? They sue that state and say she had it here. She should be under our custody, which will basically be letting her be free around the state. I mean, it's a good way to really make this country a bundle of raw nerves. We're already in a cold civil war between the Trump lovers and the people that know he's a wild, dangerous maniac, as these January 6th hearings are proving. We already have a lot of tensions between those groups. And so for the Supreme Court to say, hey, a year ago, there was the Capitol riots where Donald Trump inspired a mob to come into the Capitol and try to murder the Vice President of the United States and the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. He basically tried to decapitate the government and take over. This isn't something that could happen theoretically in 1930s Germany. This is happening here. And we know this and we've seen this. It is scary. When you look at those hearings, the most terrifying thing is that it shows he went every step that he could. He tried everything. He went to the recounts and the court cases, and all he needed was one judge that was remotely sympathetic to his bullshit. He couldn't get to the courts. Then it came down to the individual states, and he tried to pressure the Secretary of State in Georgia. Find me 10,000 votes. They make it very clear that he knew he lost, but he didn't give a damn. He didn't care, which is always what I thought. I never believed he really thought he won. I just thought it didn't matter to him. Like He didn't care if he won or lost. If the Secretary of state in Georgia had helped him out, if the governor of Georgia had helped him out, if the electors that he tried to put forward for these contested states, if they had been Trump appointees instead of the people who went and did their actual job, if the recounts, if somebody had just found, quote unquote, a bag of votes for him in Wisconsin, or and then finally comes down to, let's get an angry mob to come to the Capitol and then storm the Capitol and then try to murder the vice president of the United States. Because at that point, first wants the vice president to not certify the vote. If he doesn't certify the votes, they said, oh, well, we don't know what would have happened. It's a constitutional jump baller. So if Mike Pence had gone along with what he wanted, if Bill Barr, his attorney general, had gone along with what he wanted, if Chris Krebs, the election security czar within Homeland Security, if he had come out and said, oh, yeah, there was massive vote rigging. It was very terrible against Trump. We all saw it and all that. He couldn't get any of these Republicans to go along with him. So you have to have top to bottom Republicans pretty much because that's the state of Georgia. That's Mike Pence. That's Bill Barr. That's secretaries of state in these red states. That's governors of these red states. That's state legislatures in these mostly red states like Georgia and Arizona. Top to bottom, if he had found a weak link or somebody to go along with his bullshit, it could have been a very different scenario. So the fact that he ran through every possible scenario and nothing worked, and only then was he finally out of the White House. And since he's been out of the White House, it's not like he's done what Nixon did and went into retirement or W. Bush. W. Bush went into WITSEC. I mean, he just disappeared. I mean, that guy... We we hadn't seen him barely. He didn't do that. Months after he left the White House, he immediately goes on tour like he's a damn rock band, like he's the Rolling Stones. Oh man, one last tour. You guys got to see my farewell. How many farewell tours have the Rolling Stones had? About 50 at this point. So I mean, he's like that, but it's not a farewell tour. It's a make America great, great, great again, again, again. You know, I mean, this the ellipsis at this point about make America great again, unlike the last time when I said that, but I made it great in the four years I was there, but it's not great now in the two months that I've left office. So we got to do it great again. And you know what I mean? Very complicated dynamics. Having these rallies in cow pastures in Coleman, Alabama, and all these very glamorous and very desirable spots that he's having these rallies in, where the people actually show up, unlike New York, where nobody comes to those rallies, they see him out there doing this. They see what he's done. They know he's done it. They see him out there having these rallies. They know he's desperate to make a comeback. He'd love to come back into the White House. They know his horde is still out there. They can see him online. They can see him doing crazy shit. There was just one of his horde that killed a judge in Wisconsin. A Democratic judge in Wisconsin was just murdered a couple weeks ago. And so to see this and say, you know what we should do? We should overturn abortion at this moment. Wouldn't that be great if we overturn Roe versus Wade and let every individual state make their own abortion laws because this country is not divided enough as it is. We need to have it even more at each other's throats and even more of a state's rights issue among shit because it's not bad enough that every individual state has their own gun laws, their own family court laws, their own tax codes, their own environmental regulations. DeSantis over there passing Don't Say Gay Bill and the Stop Woke Act and trying to sue Twitter if they don't let Elon Musk take it over and doing, I mean, all this bullshit that state governors now think they're entitled to do because 
I guess there is no federal government in their eyes anymore. Nobody can stop them or should stop them or what. Let's kick that down to the states. Fucking stupid and outrageous and a crazy time period to be doing that. And the only reason they're able to do it is because the majority were appointed by presidents who never won the popular vote. George W. Bush in 2000 not only didn't win the popular vote, probably lost the Electoral College, but once again, the Republican majority Supreme Court was able to step in and stop the only full recount of Florida that he ever got. So the endless bullshit and shenanigans over Florida, which you can see if you watch a documentary like 537 votes, the butterfly ballots, the dimple chads, the hanging chads, the fact that the Secretary of State was the Bush campaign chair for Florida, the fact that Jeb Bush was the governor of Florida, the fact that judges Jeb Bush had appointed were able to hear the case and stall the recount for weeks, the fact that a lot of absentee ballots that went to Gore were disqualified, the fact that the polling places were overrun the time that they actually tried to count the votes, the fact that the Supreme Court stopped a recount, the only full one that Gore ever got, where he was within less than 600 votes of the presidency in a state where millions of votes were cast. And yet, Al Gore had to perform the Mike Pence role of certifying a race he knew he was cheated out of. People forget that. In 2000, Al Gore was the vice president. So he had to do the Mike Pence role of certifying a vote he knew was bullshit and that cheated him personally. And he did it, and by him doing that, it allowed Roberts and Samuel Alito to take the court, make it even more right-wing than it already was. And then in 2016, a guy who lost the popular vote by 3 million votes but had a squeaker in three purple states, which is still fishy to me, not really sure how that happened, he was able to appoint Gorsuch to the seat Merrick Garland should be occupying, replace Kennedy, a moderate, with Brett Kavanaugh, who's not a moderate, accused of sexual assault, and was screaming at Democratic senators who called him out on that. Then, because Ruth Bader Ginsburg died six weeks before the presidential election, he's able to appoint Handmaid's Tale. So you have a seat that should have went to a liberal judge, or at least a soft, soft Democratic judge like Merrick Garland, maybe really an independent more than anything. It goes to Gorsuch. A moderate like Kennedy is replaced with Kavanaugh, and a liberal like Ruth Bader Ginsburg is replaced with Amy Coney Barrett. I would love to go ask her ghost, but like, how do you feel now? Barack Obama asked you in his second term to step off the court and let somebody younger take your place because you were already old as hell and you'd already had cancer. But because you wanted Hillary Clinton to do your replacement and you thought she'd win, you wouldn't go down and you wouldn't step down. And now the big woman's rights activist that's always like, oh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she did so much for women's rights. Well, I'll tell you what she didn't do, which was preserve abortion. And now she's going to be replaced with Handmaid's Tale, who's going to vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. You're going to set women back by decades in this country. I remember people asked her, don't you wish she'd step down? Who else would you want but me? How about any breathing human being? Who could say, no, we uphold Roe versus Wade? That's who I would want at this moment in time. Anybody. I could do it. You could do it. Anybody. And the idea that it had to be her and she's so special, one judge who's already outvoted by a conservative majority didn't convince anybody, never convinced Scalia or any of her other good friends on the court, quote unquote, to vote the way she wanted them to. Why did we need you there? We didn't need you there. We needed somebody young who wouldn't die while Trump was president. That's what we really needed to be there at that moment. You have five justices who really shouldn't be there. They're allowed to repeal Roe versus Wade. I know Roberts probably didn't vote for it. And you have Clarence Thomas there. The only judge that would vote to repeal Roe versus Wade who wasn't appointed by a president who didn't win the popular vote is Clarence Thomas, who should be impeached from the court because his wife, Jenny Thomas, helped organize the January the 6th coup. And he hasn't even gone the mildest step possible, which is recuse himself from hearing those cases. At the minimum, you could say, okay, I'll recuse myself from hearing these. He didn't even do that. You have four judges who shouldn't be there in the case of Alito, Gorsuch, Barrett, and Kavanaugh. And you have a fifth judge who should have been impeached from the court because of clear criminality and conflicts of interest that he has never acknowledged. That majority is allowed to repeal Roe versus Wade, which could easily cause acts of terrorism in this country, could kick off a second civil war in this country. To me, it's outrageous. And when you look at something like that, and instead of the news media breaking that down and making that case for them to be like, well, Biden's poll numbers are bad, it's almost like, shut the fuck up. I mean, really, the stuff going on in this country and in the world right now, Ukraine being invaded by Russia, abortion possibly being overturned, which the rich white women in the media, they don't care about that. 
because they can go to Canada or they can keep getting their abortions in New York and L.A., which is all the media is centered in right now. But in a flesh state like Alabama, it's going to be a very huge burden. Alabama is surrounded by red states. They can't drive east to Georgia, where it'll also be illegal, or west to Mississippi, where it'll also be illegal, or north to Tennessee, where it'll also be illegal, or south to Florida, where it'll also be illegal. They can't go anywhere, really, unless they get on a plane and go somewhere else. Think about a single mother in Alabama. It's kind of hard. They don't have a lot of money. Think about a teenage girl in Alabama. Kind of hard. They don't have a lot of money. It's not going to be easy for them to say, oh, give me that $700 plane ticket and fly to New York and get an abortion for a few days and pay for a hotel and all that other stuff and then fly back. And even if they did, the state legislature might pass it to where they've committed a crime anyway. So if they've texted a friend or they've told their parents or anything like that has happened and they turn them in, they go to jail. It's madness. And it's frustrating to me that the media would rather tie high gas prices to Biden and hurt him in that way than talk about the very real shit people want done that the Republican Party's not doing. I'm not the most pro-gun control Democrat. There's certainly people to the left of me on that issue. But I'll concede 75% of the country doesn't agree with me. They'd like to see these assault weapons gone. And they'd like to see this shit regulated. And they'd like to see the ages raised. And they'd like to see universal background checks. They'd like to see a lot of measures that are not being done. While, for example, the state legislature in Alabama, they passed it to where you don't have to have any permits anymore. The law enforcement agencies actually came out and said, this is not helpful to us. We get revenue and the government gets revenue from the gun permits that are issued and the registrations that are issued. And so for you to come back and say, you don't need a registration, you don't need a permit, total open carry state, no gun laws anymore, can't even get fined for any of this shit or whatever. First of all, it's costing the police a lot of money because they pay for some of their stuff that way. It doesn't help them at all. But these open carry laws, I don't understand this because if I'm sitting in a coffee shop and a guy walks in with a goddamn ooze, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave because at this point, there's been so many mass shootings. I can see some hunter, giant fucking assault rifle strapped over their back, and they walk into a Barnes and Noble. My first thought is to get the hell out of there. But they're like, hey, it's an open carry state. What's the problem? I should be able to carry a goddamn machine gun into a Chick-fil-A. I don't know why everybody's freaking out about this. Not even saying to the point of like, you can't have your machine gun, but can you leave it in your truck when you come into Chick-fil-A so you don't scare the hell out of kids? People don't shit in the ball pit at McDonald's or whatever. I mean, kids are going to poop their pants at the ball pit. And if I'm that manager, I'd like to ask them to leave at a minimum. I'd really like to call the police and have them carried out of there. It's not safe to have people be able to carry any type of gun that they want to right out in the open when you know that there could be a mass shooter or something like that. And so people don't know people are going to leave. It's going to hurt their business for the next 20 minutes. They're not making any money because everybody's left. I just don't understand that kind of mentality of like, we're not even saying you can't have the guns. We're not even saying you can't fire them outside your house. We're not even saying that you can't have them in your truck. We're saying don't bring them into the stores with you. Don't have an open carry every single place that you go. Because it's, number one, very tacky. I don't know who's got a small enough dick that they're like, oh, I can't go buy a sandwich at Arby's unless I've got my machine gun with me. Like, I must be stroking my weapon at all times. And number two, it's not safe and it scares the hell out of people. Like, it's just a little bit of courtesy. I'm very, 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 very pro-abortion. I won't even say pro-choice. I'm pro-abortion. I think there should be almost no restrictions on it whatsoever. But I could see where you go to a clinic, you get it done properly and legally and if somebody's like hey i just want to have an abortion in the middle of this burger king i can see where the business might have a problem with that i could see where they might think you know what we shouldn't allow this i can understand that type of a restriction that's how i just feel about somebody bringing an uzi into a mall i just don't i don't get that mentality of even wanting to do that i just think it would make people so uncomfortable that at a point it's just about basic manners we all love sex but if we had to walk into a movie theater and in the middle of the lobby two people were going hog wild like they were just fucking in the middle of the theater we probably feel uncomfortable with that there's a place and a venue for everything that you can do this episode mostly is about guns and abortion because those are the issues that have seen the most forward momentum although it's very strange what republicans have done with abortion because this is all they've talked about for 50 years we got to get rid of abortion we got to repeal abortion abortion is the worst we got to get rid of that we got to just out the door with abortion and yet they're about to get what they want and you notice they're talking about everything but that okay like it's quite odd for 50 years, they wanted to repeal Roe versus Wade. It looks like they might have accomplished it, and yet they're talking about gas prices. 
right? Like they're not out there saying like, hey, isn't this great thing that we've promised we would do for 50 years? We could very well achieve that. And isn't that a great reason to vote for us? And we were going to make it illegal. We're now about to make it illegal. Isn't that great that we've overturned Roe versus Wade? And I think it's because they know that in a state like Pennsylvania, it'll hurt Dr. Oz. It'll probably even hurt Herschel Walker in Georgia because you'll have this guy out there who's like, isn't it great that we no longer have abortion? And it's like, you have four illegitimate kids. It brings a lot of personal questions to him and some of these Republicans. You'll have Trump who for years would not answer if he'd ever had a woman have an abortion or not. And so it brings a lot of attention to them in a way that could be very negative. And plus, most of the anti-abortion nuts, because it's only about 20% of the nation that really, really wants abortion illegal and done away with. A woman should be forced to have a kid. Again, I look at it as slavery to force a woman to have a kid she does not want. I think you have to be a fanatic to want that. And then to grant no exemptions whatsoever for rape or incest or if it'll hurt the woman or even if there's birth defects. I don't think a woman should be forced to have a kid with Down syndrome. Fanatics who are against abortion, they say, that's horrible. That's the worst thing in the world. Well, look at little Timmy over here with abortion. How dare you say that he has no right to exist? I'm like, well, he's a 50-year-old man who can't live on his own and he needs you. And it's not your job to tell a woman that she must bring another child like that into the world because either they're going to put it up for adoption and there's only so many kids that Amy Coney Barrett can adopt. You know, they can't adopt the whole world. They can't adopt a hundred. They can only adopt 10 or so. And they're either going to put it up for adoption or the state's going to raise that kid. Or you're going to have a woman who can't do anything. She's got a very high maintenance kid that needs constant adult supervision. There are kids born with spinal problems. They can't wipe their own butt. They can't feed themselves. They can't operate even basic machines or tools. And they have to stay with that kid. They can't do anything. They have to be with them. If it's a two-parent family, one of them will probably quit working so they can do everything for that kid. You see this with families sometimes that are fanatically against abortion, where they'll have kids that have very serious birth defects. And they'll say something like, it's monstrous to even think someone could abort a child who has this. They say, oh, not everybody wants to make your lifestyle choice. Not everybody wants to say, this is my life now. I've given up my independence. I've given up my economic freedom. I've given up all these opportunities so that I can wipe a kid's butt when they're 35 years old. It's not wrong to say some people don't want to do that. And it's their choice to be able to do that or not. If you want to, certainly nothing prevents you from being the Duggars and having 27 kids or, or three kids that all have very serious birth defects. Nothing prevents you from doing that, but that's your choice. And 90% of people would not make that choice. And they're not wrong to do that. The anti-abortion nuts, they already were voting Republican. They're already going to vote Republican. They're going to keep voting Republican. And the 80% of the country that's not on that page, they're going to be very pissed off about this decision. You're asking people to give up their rights. They're taking away some of their rights which is not an easy thing to do. People don't want to give up their rights. They've already given up too many of their rights. A good tactic for the Democrats to take is to say Republicans want to take your rights away. Your voting rights, last year there was a whole wave of voting bills. They took away right after right after right. Your abortion rights, they want to get rid of that. DeSantis is saying, don't say gay. He's trying to legislate what your kids do and don't learn, even if the schools want them to. He's trying to say the Stop Woke Act, where they try to tell private businesses, here's what you can and cannot talk about. Okay, even in a private business, these are your rights. It's your freedom of speech, your freedom of religion, which could be interpreted as a freedom of identity in terms of like, hey, I'm not religious. I don't want to be religious. Freedom from religion. That's my choice. And so forcing abortion, that's not freedom from religion. And everybody who's doing it is a Catholic on the Supreme Court. Majority of this country is not Catholic. And I don't think it's necessarily right that seven out of nine justices on the Supreme Court are Catholic, okay? And I'm not saying all Catholics are against abortion. Joe Biden's not. Sonia Sotomayor is not. Nancy Pelosi, people like that. And Lindsey Graham, I remember that asshole when Kentaji Brown Jackson, he was like, what is your religion anyway? Like, I'll snippy about it. I would have loved it if she'd said, none of your damn business. Like, how great would it be if a judge was like, none of your damn business. But she was like, oh, I'm a type of Protestant or whatever. It was an uncomfortable question. I don't blame her for just getting it out of the way. But the fact that Lindsey Graham could ask that and like nobody even think that was weird or odd that he would just point blank and do it in a way that was almost like insinuating she didn't have any. And so what if she doesn't? 40% of this country is non-religious. We have had no Supreme Court justice representation. We have no presidential representation. We have no Senate representation. I think there's like one agnostic in the House. There may not even be one, but you look at the governors, the House, the Senate, the presidency, the Supreme Court. 40% of the nation has not had any representation in politics. Okay, I feel like we missed a step. We've done like, oh, you know, pretty soon we'll have the first uh, Asian transgender candidate for president. How about an agnostic where 40% of the country could be represented, where which we've seen no political representation for at all? 
If you had had this pushback against the religious right for decades, like when Reagan basically engineered them, it's always funny to me, the people that engineer this crap are the least moral people there are. You know, Reagan was the first president in American history that was divorced. It's a major sin in Christianity, or at least it used to be, getting divorced and remarried and having kids of multiple women. Well, he was the first one, and he shifted this country to the Christian right, which didn't really make sense considering all the people that had come before him that didn't, and they were more moral than he was. Trump's been divorced twice. He's been married three times. He's cheated on every wife he's ever had. He's had kids and multiple women. He's had Caligula's sex life. I mean, the guy's lived like Caligula on spring break his whole life. And he's going to lecture people on what's moral and what's not. He was talking about in these January 6th hearings, he's like, Mike Pence has to follow the Constitution. (laughs) Trump wouldn't know the Constitution if it was tattooed on his arm. I mean, literally, unless it was tattooed on the back of a porn star's ass, he would not have read it ever. Doesn't know what it says. Literally heard what he wanted to hear from. It's funny to me, the hearings just prove what you think about somebody like Trump or somebody like Putin, which is they just go for whatever they want to hear. People can say, oh, Putin's gotten bad advice from his generals. The generals who told him what he didn't want to hear, he pushed them out. And the one general who's like, oh, yeah, sure, Ukraine, man, they're going to throw a parade. They can't wait to be part of the Soviet Union again. They're going to love it. That's the guy that gets promoted. They go for what they want to hear. And it doesn't matter what their generals say, really, good advice, bad advice, no advice. They're going to hear what they want to hear. It's all what they think. With Trump, in the third hearing, they literally said, everybody around him said the vice president doesn't have the power to not certify that election. John Eastman said he did. Eastman, that's my man. That's who I'm going to listen to. Before that, it was election night. Everybody around him said, don't go out there and declare victory. But Rudy Giuliani said he should. Giuliani, he's the one who knows what he's talking about. So he's going to go for whatever he wants to hear. Nine people could say, please don't do this. This is not right. One person could tell him what he wants to hear, which they're only saying it because they know that's what he wants to hear. And that's who he's going to listen to. How are people like this determining our morality? And then people would say, well, what does that have to do with the libertarian lie? What does that even mean? I mean, wouldn't you then be a libertarian to the extent of like socially liberal, economically conservative. I wouldn't be at all because I'm economically liberal as well. But the libertarian lie refers to really two things. One is that the majority of the country is libertarian or wants to be which they're not. The majority of the country is probably divided somewhat between liberalism, probably 20 to 30% of the country that are liberal. Even if they don't take that label, they definitely are liberal. Then you have um, hardcore conservatism, somewhat of the Christian right, somewhat religious, somewhat fascist. That's probably another 20 to 30% of the nation. Then when you get to your independence, a lot of those times people are can be quite communitarian, which is to be economically liberal and socially conservative. A lot of the winners for uh, you know Republicans is this culture war stuff. They'll come out there and they'll talk about, we got to stop wokeness, and people won't even know what that means. Like, yeah, yeah, we got to stop that. Well, that's just reinterpreted from, we got to stop political correctness. So for years it was political correctness has gone too far. Now it's uh, cancel culture and it's wokeness or whatever. So a lot of that stuff they do pretty well on when it comes to immigration. Typically have more people than not when it comes to immigration. I think they typically have more people than not when it comes to the culture war stuff, the stuff that DeSantis is focused on or whatever, those people might be for them on that. But when it comes to economic issues, they don't necessarily like that America has the most expensive healthcare system in the world. They don't like that America has the most lobbying in the world, the biggest super PACs, the least campaign finance reform. You know, these are people that don't necessarily want billionaires to pay no taxes. Or when Elon Musk is whining about a wealth tax, they're kind of like, well, that doesn't really affect us and we don't care. And why don't you want to pay 2% on a hundred billion dollars in a country that you immigrated to and it made you rich. And if you'd been in South Africa, you wouldn't even be a billionaire, let alone worth a hundred billion dollars. So why do you not think that you owe this country something more than you do? It kills me when it comes to immigration that people are very hateful about certain types of immigrant groups, but yet the same people who are like, oh, there's too much immigration in this country and be like, oh yeah, well, what about the Australian that owns the only TV network that you watch, Rupert Murdoch? What about the billionaire South African plutocrat, Elon Musk, that you now worship on Twitter who doesn't want to pay taxes and he praises Chinese workers and he hates unions and all the stuff that would benefit you, he's against it. And then what about Ted Cruz who was born in Canada to a Cuban father or Donald Trump who had the first immigrant first lady and Melania Trump and doesn't really seem to like anything but Eastern European women. And I just look at it as like they like certain types of immigrant groups, the ones that are very greedy and stingy and take a very opportunistic view of America. I like immigrants that come to America and they want to put down roots and they want to pay taxes and they want to really invest in the country. And I don't like 
so do the international playground. Like you'll have Arabic people that come to Los Angeles and like a Saudi Arabian guy will be drag racing cars down an LA strip or whatever. And he's got diplomatic immunity so nobody cares or can do anything about it. Or the homelessness crisis in LA because we got this asshole Rick Caruso. He's running for mayor and he's a real estate developer that built a lot of shopping malls and complexes and things like that. And he's like, I'm the only one who can solve homelessness. Why? Because you created it in the first place. The developers in LA, they're not going to make housing less expensive. He'll run on the issue of homelessness and then he'll get in there and he'll be like, oh, you know what? Uh, When I said we were going to make 100,000 new homes, it turns out they're too expensive and we can't do it. You know, all the shit they've said for years because other mayors have looked at that idea in the past. They've said it's too expensive. We can't do it. It's not economical. And he'll say that and then like, so we'll just arrest more people. We'll just lock them up. Which when you arrest more people and you put them in jail, that doesn't really solve anything. Vagrancy is a misdemeanor. They're in jail for a few months up to a year. Then they get back out. They're still homeless and they're worse off than they've ever been because now they're on a probation system that costs money. District attorneys that wanted to end cash bail and wanted to shorten the probation time periods, they've all been recalled because of these fucking hardcore anti-crime people in California that are recalling them left and right. You come down to a guy who's got no real solutions and they'll probably just make real estate prices go up even more and get even higher. Why are they so high in a place like Los Angeles? Well, a lot of the buildings are half empty because they're a billionaire in Russia's summer home or something like that. Like the oligarchs in Russia, you're seeing their wealth get seized. Their favorite thing was American real estate. They loved American real estate because that was something that was very stable and something that they thought could pay a decent return. But in LA, you'll have these buildings in downtown LA, other parts of LA. There was one building that the units were like four to $5,000 a month. That's the rent, which nobody can afford that shit. It's half empty. And they'd rather keep the rates artificially high, have the building empty basically, than to lower them a little bit and let people in to actually be able to afford it. But a lot of it is, oh, there might be a billionaire in China or the Middle East or Russia or someplace, and they own a lot of property in and around California. They love California property. They love New York property. And this is creating a huge drain on the American system to where anybody can come in. They can buy property. They don't have to live in it at all. They might stay in it less than two weeks out of the year. They might not stay in it at all. But they own all this stuff. And all the wealth goes back overseas to the people that own it. That's a very opportunistic view of immigration into America. It's not somebody from Italy 60 years ago who came on a boat and then they're here and then they want to work and they want to open a pizzeria and they want to pay taxes and they want to do all that stuff. That's not what's happening. So you can see where people would be frustrated with that, but I don't see Fox News viewers frustrated with that. I see them concerned with what they think of as the horde that's on the southern border and they're going to overflow the country and the country's going to be mostly Latino. It's crazy to me to see polls that say that Latinos don't actually vote Democratic. First of all, in America, about half of Latinos those self-identify as white. A lot of the people that would vote Democratic, they can't vote for various reasons. They may have an arrest or they may not be fully legal or they may not be citizens or whatever, or they just haven't uh, invested time into getting registered to vote. A lot of the people that actually do vote that are considered Latinos, like something like a third to a half of them are Republicans. As Republicans have based a huge part of their identity around, we're being replaced by Latinos. The horde on the border, we have to keep that out. And they, there'll be somebody who's Latino standing right by them. Yeah, you're right. we got to get those people fucking gone and be like, well, wait a minute. Was it your grandmother one of those people? Yeah, but that was a long time ago when I'm here now. Fuck those people. Immigration is one of those issues. You'll probably never solve it because every country has a battle about it. Mexico has a battle about it. We say, oh, we don't want Mexicans here. Mexico's saying we don't want Guatemalans here. Guatemalans are saying we don't want El Salvadorians here. And it just goes like that. El Salvadorians are probably saying we don't want Nicaraguans here. And it just keeps going on down the list. And so every country has something like that. You'll have uh, people in Nigeria being like, well, I hate London because I'm treated like garbage and those British people they're such snobs and right in the next breath they'll be like oh those people from Congo and Central Africa coming to Nigeria they're ruining the place it's one of those things that probably every country on earth has some kind of animosity towards people and they think they're taking their resources even in Somalia the north and the south don't necessarily get along someone from the rural areas might not be embraced in the city it's all about someone who's poor coming to an area that's wealthier for economic opportunities and people who are there they may view it as you're taking something from us you're trying to bleed our wealth. The government's got to provide for you. Our tax dollars pay for this or you're taking an opportunity that could theoretically go to my kids. I don't know if you can really solve that. I think Europe's done a good job with the European Union and I'd love to see that kind of model adopted but it's very hard to get there when in the United States there's this contingent of people that run everything who call themselves libertarians. They don't even think the states should be on the same page. They don't even think the federal government should exist. So when I talk about things like I want America and Canada to merge. I want the USA to all 
probably one enormous country. Canada and the U.S. is one country. It's bigger than Russia geographically. The economy is huge. It's bigger than the European Union. It's, it's hard to get there when each individual state is setting their own laws for everything. And people don't seem to even think the federal government should exist. So when I get to the libertarian lie, half of it is that a lot of people are libertarians or necessarily want to be or would benefit from that. I think online there's a lot of white males that are libertarians and they spam the hell out of YouTube comments, Yahoo comments, Reddit message boards. Every single time that a political conversation has happened, the white male horde shows up and just spams it with libertarianism. The second lie is basically that they are libertarian because I've never met a libertarian who cared as much about abortion rights as they do tax cuts. Most libertarians I meet, I would say they're 90% economically conservative, maybe 10% socially liberal. And I mean, people will say, no, 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 I know this one guy and he wants pot to be legal. Well, pot's legal. Pot's been legal. Gay marriage is legal. Gay marriage is the law of the land and it has been. So when people say, I'm socially liberal, I believe in gay marriage and marijuana being legal, most conservatives now believe in that stuff. So what it comes down to is a lot of issues that people are not that socially liberal on. The wokeness, the political correctness, the transgender girls in sports, things like that. Those are now the nuts and bolts social issues that have sort of replaced the stuff that we all kind of agree about, like gay marriage. You know, I'm not going to say everybody agrees on gay marriage, but I'd say probably 80% of the country does. Then you come down to these libertarians I meet all the time who are like, well, you know, a woman's right to choose. I don't know. I mean, it comes down to individual property laws and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, so you're squishy on the one big thing that would probably make you more socially liberal and you're economically conservative on rich people should pay no taxes at all and there should be a, a fair tax system as you call it which is really unfair which is everybody pays the same tax and and it's usually a lot of people who they're conservative or they're republican but they don't want to say that because that brand is so damaged and they'll say no no i voted for gary johnson in the presidential race and i'm like in 2016 if you didn't vote for hillary clinton you voted for trump so voting for gary johnson and voting for jill stein or whatever all that's a vote for trump so if you come out there and be like oh i just couldn't vote for hillary clinton and Donald Trump, if you can't see the difference between those two, to be like, I voted for Gary Johnson. I didn't help Trump become president directly, but you did because you didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. You can't look at those two and tell me that you don't have a, a preference for Hillary to be president and then be like, I'm a moderate. You're not a moderate. <laughs> I just hate to tell you that Hillary was slammed over and over and over for being too moderate, too centrist, too hawkish, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so to have a moderate like her come up and then have a raving lunatic like Trump come up and be like, oh, well, I choose neither one of them because I'm a moderate. It. That's not where the goal is. The goalposts have been moved from where they were. I guess if there was a third way to consider the libertarian lie, it would have to be the fact that has been spread for decades, which is that the government is evil. The government is wrong, always. The government can do nothing right, ever. And the federal government specifically is terrible. It kills me the people who talk about government tyranny, but they're okay with a governor having a shitload of power. At the federal level, it's tyranny. At the state level, well, that's where all the power should be. Individual states should be able to decide everything. And then even when you get to the city level, because most red states have huge blue cities within them. So Joe Biden can't tell Ron DeSantis what to do, but Ron DeSantis can tell him what to do. But Democratic mayors within Florida, they can't tell Ron DeSantis what to do. City level, irrelevant. State level, God level federal level shouldn't exist. So that always kind of bothers me because probably roughly 30 states in America are going to be pretty conservative at the state level because obviously almost half the country lives in 10 states. I think it's somewhere right about 50% of the nation lives in the 10 most populated states. So you have a ton of states like Idaho and Wyoming, the Dakotas, Montana, Alaska. Should these States all get the same and equal vote as Illinois or New York or California. Of course not. Ridiculous to think that they should, but that's the way they like it. They like an electoral college system where Wyoming gets more of a vote based on the population percentage they have than California does. They like a Senate where two senators from Wyoming can vote against two senators from California and nothing can get done. The Dakotas can outvote California in that. And they like it to where you have to pass an amendment to get it past two-thirds of states. I don't know what you could get past two-thirds of states right now that would be remotely positive. I don't know if you could do anything at an amendment level when, again, you've got 10 states with no people in them. The non-coastal west, you can jump through the non-coastal west and not see a person for 15 minutes, you know. 
and you have to somehow get an amendment past two thirds of states. So it's stacked at the amendment level, the Senate level, this electoral college level. And that's why these people love the idea that DeSantis can run around like Napoleon Jr. I mean, the guy's just issue whatever brain fart pops into his head, he can sign into a bigoted law. I want to rip up the black congressional districts. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Oh, yes, Ron, that would be a good. It's like you're the governor of Florida who died and made you emperor of France. You know what I mean? Like, why do you think you have all this power? And yet, if Gavin Newsom over in California does anything, if he tries to do anything big, he'll be recalled. I mean, the best governor in the country during the pandemic was Gavin Newsom. And last year, they tried to recall him because the way the laws are here, they're so democratic and they're so open and they're so equal that if you can get enough signatures, you can force a recall vote. Well, like I said, California is 30% Republican, not the majority of the state by any stretch of the imagination, but it's enough where they can get enough signatures to force a recall vote. They made him run for election in 2021 as a recall. This year, he's had to run for re-election. So it's almost like if you're a Democrat, Democratic governor, you're constantly running for re-election. If you try to do anything big, they can recall you. If you're Ron DeSantis in Florida, this is an election year for him. He's up for re-election, and he's pissed off Disney, which has brought thousands of jobs to Florida. And they wanted to bring more. They were asking, there's not an exact count, but I know it was several thousand California workers to move to Florida. That's what they wanted them to do. And in the same year where they've asked them to do that, I mean, in 2021, they said, we need you to move to Florida. We need you to basically quit. You'll have to find some other place to work. The same company doing that, the same starts a war with them. We want to take away your self-autonomous status in this region of Orlando. It's crazy to me. These people that were helping him put this big feather in his cap and be like, aren't I better than Gavin Newsom? We're taking thousands of jobs from California to Florida, then he turns around and wants to start a fight with Bob Shapak, who's a closet Republican, and giving him money, and he wants to start a fight with this guy that's the CEO of Disney. For what? But the fact that an idiot can run around and do whatever the fuck he wants in a state like Florida, and yet at the federal level, where Joe Biden has won more of the popular vote than any president who's ever existed, he can't pass a fart through Congress, and it drives people crazy. It's just one of those things where it's almost easier to just go into your silo. Like you can watch Fox News and you can see all the immigrants they're invading us at the border. And isn't it great that we all have guns so we can fight them? And and then the Democrats can turn on MSNBC and be like, why do we even have guns? Guns should be made illegal. If you try to basically confiscate 300 million guns, you'd bankrupt the country and it wouldn't be possible. And you just put more people in jail where they already shouldn't be. If you put more people in jail as a district attorney, you'll probably be reelected for the rest of your life because if you ever try to keep people out of jail. They're going to recall you like they did the guy in San Francisco. It's such a frustrating system. And the fact that people keep pushing the libertarian lie, which is that we can have 50 individual states all deciding what they want to do on even basic stuff. I don't see how a country can be what it can be acting like that. People have always said, oh, states' rights, that's the key to America's success. That's bullshit. Absolute bullshit. America has not faced a real enemy from without meaning from outside the country, probably since the War of 1812. And even that was somewhat ambiguous because I read a book called The Civil War of 1812, which was great, talking about how Canada and the United States, it was so many of the same people. You could almost classify that as a mini civil war because it was the people were so mixed up together. But you haven't seen real threats internationally, probably in two centuries, because even the Nazi empire, as formidable as they were, Hitler never put boots on the ground in Kansas. And then all the wars we've had since then, the Viet Cong and ISIS, you might have noticed they never rolled tanks up through Florida, did they? We've never really been invaded or even close to being invaded 200 years, if you don't count the Mexican War, which we kind of started because we wanted a huge chunk of Mexico. And yet internally is all of our conflicts, the Civil War, the civil rights movement, trying to end segregation in the Southeast, the Trump voters that tried to storm the Capitol and overtake it. China would have never been able to do that. China couldn't have 10,000 people storm our Capitol and take it. They would have been slaughtered. They would have been killed like dogs. Our own citizens who think they're entitled to do whatever the fuck they want because they've been spoiled rotten for so long, they think they can just do that and get away with it. They showed the footage of one of the Proud Boys or whoever, you know, they look like the Hog Boys. Every one of them's about 300 pounds with a beard. Look like they hadn't had a bath in about 10 weeks. He's like, parents better do what we want him to do. Oh yeah, this is a man who should be catered to. It's that Pharaoh mentality. DeSantis has it. Trump has it. Everyone should do what I want them to do. I don't want them to have an abortion, so that should be illegal. I want to be able to carry my assault rifle into 
to a fucking Starbucks. I should be able to do that. I don't want people to say anything that can make me uncomfortable. So let's pass the Stop Woke Act because I don't want to hear about racism. It's that idea that the entire country should conform to what they want even though they're a minority. And so they like the idea of the state's rights argument where the minority rules. It's not really about population. You can have 10 million people in California and you can have 10,000 people in Wyoming. They get the same say at the Senate level and the state's rights level. But that's killing this nation. And I'm surprised that it hasn't had a worse impact than it already has. But every single major conflict we've had has been internally. And it's this state's rights bullshit, this libertarian bullshit that's killing us. The fact that we don't think we should be united on anything. And libertarians, the era they hate the most is the era that was the best. The 1930s to the late 1960s. The FDR period to the LBJ period. Every single thing that you probably love about this country that you actually enjoy came from that period. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, the Air Force, the CIA, disability insurance, unemployment insurance, WIC, food stamps, Pell Grants, public housing, NASA, the interstate system, integration of the Southeast, the integration of the military, probably a dozen other things I'm forgetting. You could even say the sexual revolution, the beginnings of abortion being legal in this country because people were fighting so hard for it. Libertarians hate that time period. And they like the Reagan time period when he comes around and tries to reverse every single thing that came out of that. Deregulate this, tax cut that, disband this government agency, cut the funding for that one, make America worse in a thousand different ways and death by 10,000 cuts. And the fact that we've embraced that ideology to where people can now proudly say, you know, I'm a libertarian. Like it's such a great thing because then you can be like, hey, I'm neither a far lefty or a Republican. I'm, I'm a reasonable moderate. I'm in between. You're keeping the country being from what it really could be. If we were truly united on everything and the majority of people actually got what they wanted, 80% of people would love to see assault weapons gone. I don't just mean the age raised. I mean gone. They don't think anybody should have them and they're probably right. I've been against gun control laws in the past and I'm saying that as somebody who's not necessarily on that page, but I can understand why people would do that. And if 80% of the country wants it, who am I to stand in their way just because what? Somebody should be able to play with their toys? 80% of the nation likes the way the abortion laws are and would like to see the red states take a softer stance to where it's not so difficult to get one. They'd love to see a female president. Hillary Clinton won by 3 million more votes than Donald Trump did. Over and over again, you can run through the list and see that a lot of this stuff is just the minority of people getting every damn thing that they want. But because they look like the majority, it's not necessarily all white males, but it's maybe half of them or a quarter of them, and they're very, very loud, and they storm the Capitol if they don't get what they want. And on the internet, they raise hell to the people who go and be like, Alabama liberal, more like Alabama libel. You don't know jack shit, bitch. It's those loud-ass people, the horde. They come everywhere online. They attack you. They act like you're stupid because they watched the Grover Norquist video on YouTube 10 years ago. And, oh, aren't they brilliant? Those people get everything they want. And if they didn't, we could have a coherent, united country. Imagine what we could accomplish. Free energy, like I talked about. Never paying for fuel or energy cost ever again. 10% of your budget that probably goes to heating and air conditioning and fuel cost and gas and things. All that back in your pocket to spend on whatever you wanted to spend it on. Legalized prostitution, which we should have had and which a lot of libertarians, weirdly enough, don't really come out in full force about, which is the one thing you think that they could. But a lot of guys in this country, why do they want guns so bad? They can't get laid. Got to get them laid. Canada and the United States uniting into a mega power, more geographic area than Russia, a bigger economy than China. Unstoppable. What I believe we should have is a sovereign wealth fund. That way you could fix the deficit and the only way you really can, because the idea that you can have austerity, the idea you can cut spending enough to fix a $20 trillion deficit, it's a fantasy that the libertarians have spread that is stupid. What you really need is more government control and a sovereign wealth fund that could invest, put a trillion dollars into Apple. Then if the stock doubles, $2 trillion, you get your investment back. You've just taken a trillion dollars off the goddamn deficit. I mean, it's a very easy way to do things, but we'll never have that as long as any time the government takes any interest in the economy. Oh my my God, socialism, this is the worst shit that's ever happened. We can't have this. Oh my God, the worst. So for all these reasons and more, I'm against the libertarian lie. I would love to see a few reasonable gun control measures, although I don't believe that guns are really the end-all, be-all scourge that we're seeing. I remember Bill Clinton was on James Corden recently, and he talks about America ending democracy. He says, I've never been more worried about us losing our democracy, and Corden stared at him. And then when it came up to the topic of guns, Corden jumped in like, oh, we got to get rid of guns. It's like, okay, rich people, we know, we know, you don't want to be gunned down. We know you're very scared of guns because you're very wealthy, but the end of our democracy is a little 
probably more important than, you know, people not being able to carry a handgun. I think that's a tad more important than getting rid of that. But I fully concede that most people that are liberal are not with me on that. And then when it comes to abortion, I'd love to see it even more legal. Thanks for listening, everybody. I appreciate you. Stay tuned for episode 93.